With so much time in my hands, I suppose I should tell you the whole story and start it where it should be started. The beginning. When I was young, and I, I mean roughly five or six years old, I thought that it was my imagination. The voices speaking in sinister tones, they were, they were nothing more than the sounds of my young conscience. I thought they kept me safe, they helped me understand what I should be doing to keep up with my friends since they were all I had. See, I was an only child, raised in a home where my parents did what they had to to keep me alive, but they never really wanted me. They, they gave me a room and food and drink, basically just what they were required to, you know, that would keep DHS from showing up, but they never played with me or really showed me any affection. I was more like a pet to them, or a houseplant. I barely spent any time in my house, always playing in the woods just beyond our backyard. I'd play by myself mostly, but sometimes I'd have one of the neighbor kids to play with, and we would build forts and set booby traps to keep people out. The trap-making skills of a young child my age were always much more of a concept than any form of actual danger or deterrent, but it did help me pass hours and hours of time as I played alone in the forest. I think my solitude is what brought the voices to me in the first place. You know, as, as I grew, most of what I learned about the world was from the neighborhood kids. Going to school for me was difficult because I could hardly concentrate with the screams and shouting echoing through my head. It seemed to always get louder the further I got from the woods in my backyard. By the time I turned ten, the dull roar inside my mind had turned into actual sentences, and sometimes commands. The voices began to teach me things, and when I didn't understand something, the voices would often explain it. When I first learned that not everyone had the voices, I thought it was just some sort of superpower. That it was somehow more important or special than the other kids, or adults for that matter. The first real problem I had with the voices was when I was 11 and they taught me how to make real traps, ones that were actually dangerous. They instructed me on how to dig a hole and sharpen sticks to put at the bottom, then how to cover it with leaves and twigs so that you couldn't see it. I was so proud of myself once I had a complete, I mean, be sure there were only three or four sharpened sticks at the bottom, but that took a lot of work to scrape them on concrete or rocks till they were pointy. A few days went by after I'd made it. I had forgotten all about it when the voices told me they were bored and that I should see if the neighbor kid wanted to play in the woods with me. To my surprise, the kid did. The voices led me into the forest, but, but even as I followed their commands, I was confused as to where they were taking me. Stop! The echoed yell of the voices boomed through my skull, and I, f I held in place. I just stood curiously, looking around, trying to figure out why they had told me to stop here. My friend kept walking ahead of me, and I suddenly realized where we were as the branches broke and he fell into the pit. I ran to the edge of it and tried to help him out. The voices in my head exploded with laughter when I saw that one of the sharp sticks had pierced the meat of his calf. The other sticks looked like they had long before fallen over, and thus were thankfully completely ineffective. My friend howled in pain as blood began to run down his leg. In a near sense of panic, I jumped down the three-ish feet to the bottom and helped him out of the hole. I didn't really know what to do at that age, so I left the stick in and I helped him hobble back to his house where his parents called an ambulance. The voices couldn't stop laughing in my head for nearly an hour, and his parents were extremely mad, but I... I never was completely sure who they were mad at. I didn't know if they were mad at me for taking him out there or him for being out in the woods screwing around like that. I do know that he was never allowed to play with me in the forest again. After that, the voices began asking me to do things I didn't really care to do. They would either find a way to trick me into doing it, or hound me inside of my mind until, uh, until I gave in and did whatever they were commanding. They began small, simple things that were easy to talk me into because it felt almost like typical childhood playing, like burning bugs and ants with a magnifying glass. The ants always smelled so badly when they burned, that sometimes they would find a way for me to play that was a little more unorthodox, like finding a dead bird and hitting it with a baseball bat like some sort of cruel and demented home run derby. 
Those games I never would have thought to play on my own. But the voices always made it seem like it would just be fun enough to make me feel like I was playing a sport like the other kids. The voices would howl with laughter each time. And I would smile. Feeling like I was making someone happy or, or in a sense, proud of me. As you can imagine, when my interests, if you could even call them that, were activities like playing with dead birds and burning insects, that I was very quickly losing friends, or in the very least, I wasn't making any new ones. This led to a rather lonely childhood. Yes, I still did have a few friends that would play with me on occasion, but for the most part, the only thing that ever kept me company were the voices in my head. When I grew into my mid-teens, the voices took more shape. I mean this in two different aspects. The first being that the voices slowly melded together into one deep, echoed voice, almost like a large group of raspy, deep voice old men saying the same sentence at the same time, only their timing had gotten better. The other aspect was that now the voices truly had a shape. They'd become the blurry shadow behind me in the mirror, or the distorted figure reflected in the ripples of a puddle. It followed me wherever I went now. I'd it was just hiding at the periphery of my vision, lurking just out of focus, taunting me, guiding me. They always seemed to be just over my shoulder, touching me, yet I could feel nothing. It was like that voice in the back of your mind, except mine had a much stronger and more malevolent opinion on everything around me. When I got my first job at the age of 14... I saved my little heart out so I could buy a car when I hit 16. I knew my parents sure weren't going to help me. Other than the food and shelter they provided, I basically raised myself. And come to think of it, if it weren't for the guidance of the voices in my head, I'm not, not, I'm not entirely sure that I would have made it this far. But when I hit 15, my voices started demanding that I do things that, if I think about it now, would be what I would call sacrifices. And they pressured and begged and threatened to make my life a living hell with unrelenting screams inside my skull until I finally relented. At first, the offerings were small. I felt like it was a way for them to ease me into the idea of fulfilling these horrible requests. Ones that I had no desire to complete. They started by having me catch frogs or other small palm-sized animals and and to mutilate them or to torture them to death. I could feel my own sanity beginning to crack. Those horrible suggestions screamed through my head with each animal I found. Throw it in the blender, the voices would say, following it with malicious laughter. Put it in a Tupperware container. Watch it cook in the hot sun. Another would echo through my mind. I never thought any of the poor animals deserved it. A few times I would yell back at them, resisting, announcing that I was in control and for them to shut up. However, if I didn't do what they asked, no matter how much I refused, they would begin to scream in my mind, like, until I was driven insane and not, not being able to escape their incessant screaming, I would finally relent and follow their orders for nothing more than to make the screaming stop. Each time I relented, and as soon as I completed their gruesome tasks, They'd roar with laughter for hours, commenting and making jokes about whatever poor creature they had just made me torture before finally leaving me alone for another week or so. At this point, I no longer believed that they were my superpowers. I no longer believed that they, they were trying to help me. No longer that they were making me special in any way, but instead I knew that I was being haunted by something. Some malevolent force that I wasn't truly sure what it wanted. As things escalated, not only did I question what it wanted, but also why it had chosen me to put through this psychological torture. A week after I turned 16, I got the car that I had saved so hard for. It was an older Toyota Corolla, and I knew that it wasn't much, but it was mine, and it ran well enough to get me around. It was another well-deserved sense of freedom that I had not experienced before. And as I drove through the streets in my town, the shadow remained in my rearview mirror. It had been silent for months now, but it never left the edge of my vision. I was, I was never truly alone. 
The presence was always there, just looking over my shoulder, whispering into my ear, suggesting various things as I tried to go about my days. None of it was ever anything helpful anymore. Always malicious, always sadistic. Forever begging for that next sacrifice to it. Sadly and suddenly, a small white dog ran into the road. I hit the brakes and began to swerve around it when the voices erupted in my head, startling me as the force spoke to me for the first time in so long. Hit it! The voices screamed through my mind so loud that I had to whine in pain. What? Hell no! I thought as I continued breaking. Do it now! The voices boomed. It was so much deeper and much more demonic pitch than the first time. We will not command again. Hit it now. We demand it. No! No, I won't do it! I shouted out loud into my rearview mirror and the empty car, and I knew it heard me. It always heard me, even when I wasn't saying any things out loud. Hit it, hit it, hit it, hit it! It yelled over and over and over, sounding like a choir of infinite voices demanding the same hellish command. No! I cried out, only causing them to get angrier and louder as they repeated the order. I yelled out in agony as my foot slipped from the brake and I mashed the gas pedal. I cried as the thud sounded and the car bounced and the dog rolled beneath the tires. The voices rang out in a cacophony of sadistic laughter in my head and abruptly stopped and went silent again. Tears welled in my eyes as I looked in the rearview mirror to see the dog's lifeless body laying in the street. I saw it only for a second before my view was obstructed as the dark shadow formed in my rearview mirror. It had become more clear now as it formed. I noticed that for the first time it had a face. Sinister and dark, smiling far wider than it made sense, and the eyes held evil in them to the likes I had never seen. I quickly trained my eyes back to the road, and through the silence and my tear-filled eyes, I, I turned and I headed back home. After that, I was trying my best to continue fighting the voices and the figure, but it just brought on more cunning ways to gain its sacrifices. With each one, it gained more of a presence and more clarity in my world and in my life. I would come outside to start my car for school, only to find that it had lured a cat into the engine. The start of my car would kill it, forcing me to murder it with no option to fight the sadistic orders. I no longer had a choice. It just set up scenarios that would get it its sacrifice without me having a chance to refuse. I had become nothing more than a vessel, just an engine for the demon's sick and twisted games. It was hell-bent on, on some grand plan, some behind-the-scenes goal that I was unaware of. And once I was in tune with the voices, they helped me survive my early childhood. But now I was no longer in control and the voices just used me to interact with things in my world. People and animals were mere playthings of the demon, and it had decided that the only way to rip the heads off the dolls was to use my body and my hands to do it. This continued as I made my way into college. My friends and roommates all thought it was just that I had the worst of luck, but I couldn't correct them. I couldn't let them know the constant turmoil raging beneath my skin. I was constantly surrounded by death, traps and situations that had been set up for me to fall into, but ultimately ended with it appearing to be my doing. The demon had gained so much power over me and I was completely helpless to stop it. I could barely recognize myself when I looked in the mirror anymore. The person I was as a kid was no longer the person I am now. To myself, I felt like, like, like I looked emaciated. Gaunt. It looked like I had a life filled with beatings and starvation, however, it was always hard to see myself in the mirror clearly because the demon no longer stood over my shoulder or behind me. When I look in the mirror, I see my own sad and weak form. But the demon's now a faded overlay in the reflection. With each new death, my reflection fades as his gains more opacity, and I don't know if, if he's replacing me or if... If we're melding together to become the same being. But there's nothing I can do to stop it. My next big turning point was during my second year of college. 
I had been lured into the woods near the campus by voices. I fought them the whole time in my head and with every step. But I could no longer get my body to respond to how much I didn't want to go. The darkness of the night had no effect or meaning to the voices as they walked my puppet of a body deeper into the woods until I came to a clearing. In front of me sat a group of other college students, none of them of which I knew from classes that I had. Three girls, two guys, they sat, sat around a small campfire as I stumbled into the clearing, still trying to resist what the demon was making me do. Perfect, the grumble of the voice had said as I saw the people. It followed with a sort of sinister chuckle inside my head. Please, leave. I said as I got closer to the campfire, trying to do my best to prevent whatever the demon was planning. What? Who the fuck are you? One of the guys said, confused and offended at my sudden order. Yeah, I don't think so, buddy. Why don't you get the fuck out of here? Said the other, with heavy sarcasm and a false sense of confidence. Just as my body had entered their circle around the fire, he may have been trying to mask it, but it was obvious he was just trying to look tough in front of the three girls. Please just go. I don't want to do this. I cried out in front of them, my voice filled with pain and regret. A deep, sinister laugh began to build in my mind, and the voices began to speak again. Kill. 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 A chant rose in the background while the main voice of the demon began speaking. I require their blood. You can get it for me willingly, or I'll force you to take it. But it will be mine. Horror flashed in my eyes at the sound of the command, and I could tell that the people around the campfire could see it. I stood stunned, still fighting with every fiber of my being, just trying to avoid this situation. I, I just wanted to go back home, to keep to myself, to go to bed. I, I wanted to become a hermit and live where I couldn't hurt anyone or anything anymore. All these thoughts raced in my mind as the sinister laughter and chanting began to echo louder in my ears. No, who the fuck is your problem, bro? Get the hell out of here, the first guy said to me. He broke my train of thought as he did his best to try to establish dominance over the situation. You, what's his deal? Is he some sort of perv? One of the girls said to the other two in a whiny, annoying tone. And just then, the torture from the voices screaming in my head became too much and my mind broke. My eyes glazed over and the demon began to laugh loudly in my skull. I ran to the fire and pulled out a burning log from it. I smashed the first guy in the face, catching his beard on fire and knocking him out cold at the same time. Moving with speed and strength I had never possessed before, I ran to the girl who had spoken and lifted her out of her seat by her throat, crushing her windpipe. I tossed her onto the fire and her clothes quickly caught and began to burn. The other guy broke from his shock and ran to me, swinging his fists, slamming them into my head and stomach. But to my surprise, having no effect... I grabbed him by the throat and headbutt him, crushing his skull and sending blood spattering over his face, and then dropped him. I then dropped his suddenly lifeless body, letting it slump to the ground like nothing more than a sack of loose meat. An animalistic roar erupted from my throat, a sound I didn't even think was possible for me to make. The other two girls began to scramble as the surprise and shock wore off. I grabbed one by the legs and swung her into the other, knocking them both to the ground. I drove my hands into the stomachs of one of the girls. My fingers tore through her flesh and to her insides. My fingers wrapped around the insides of her ribcage and I threw her against a tree. Loud cracking sounds as her spine shattered and her body fell to the ground and the last girl did her best to crawl away, her legs broken from being thrown. I slowly walked towards her, as an unusually large grin began to form on my face. What the fuck are you? The girl said, her voice so full of terror it was hard to even understand her words. I walked towards her and I knelt by her face. My eyes still glazed over in solid black, a voice that was not my own came from my throat. I am everything. The demon said through me as I raised my foot and slammed it down on the woman's skull, crushing it against a rock. Another howl and roar emitted from my chest, and the voices screamed with laughter and cheering. An eruption of glowing embers looking like fireworks showered around me as I was hit in the back with a burning log. I quickly turned to see the first guy had regained consciousness. The glaze in his still-focusing eyes and his singed and half-missing beard told me that he, he wasn't fully sure of what had or was happening around him. As I turned and saw him, the demon began to laugh through me. 
A deep and billowing laugh at this man's feeble attempt to take me down. I could feel the hot, rage-filled blood course through my veins as I took two steps towards him and kicked him in the center of the chest. The man flew back and hit a tree before sliding down and onto the ground at the base of it. A final roar exploded from my chest as I stepped on his legs. My thumb pierced into his eye socket as my fingers pressed into his mouth. As I gripped the roof of his mouth, I gave an effortless tug and pulled his head from his body. Veins still dripping while tendons and muscle tissue dangled from the bottom of his neck. The muscles in his body instantly relaxed and his torso slid over and toppled onto the ground. I tossed the head into the fire and the choir of voices laughed and screamed with excitement. Slowly I walked back to my apartment. When I got there, I did nothing more than take a shower and pass out on the bed. The demon's bloodlust seemed to subside for the rest of the school year. The authorities chalked it up to an aggressive bear attack because, because they could come up with no better excuse for the ferocity and strength needed to inflict such damage. I dropped out of college at the end of that year and decided to move out west to the hills and forests. Being in college kept me around too many people, too many, too many opportunities for the demon to satisfy his urges for death. On my road trip to move was the final moment of control. I had stopped at an overlook in the mountains of Arizona. In my car were any and all of my possessions in life, so I decided to drive around in a very erratic path across the country. I had gone up to Montana and then down to Arizona, and I, I figured that my ultimate destination would be somewhere in the woods, Wyoming or Oregon. As I stood at the edge, looking over the cliff of the overlook, contemplating if I should if I should continue my plan so I could have some some form of life, or if I should stop the demon from taking full control and throwing myself over the edge. The hairs on the back of my neck began to tingle. And just as I began to notice it, a jeep pulled up to the overlook behind me. Four college-age guys that looked to be football players, you know, the muscular athletic builds, even blonde or frosted tip dye jobs, very boy bandish, got out and immediately began to be obnoxious. Two of them began running back and forth, passing a football to each other, while the other two opened beers out of a cooler and walked to the edge of the overlook, bragging about some frat party or something of the sort they had recently been to. It started off soft, but quickly boomed and echoed in my mind. The voice that I was so dreading, it spoke again for the first time since the campfire. Them, was all it said. One word. One time. I knew what it wanted me to do, but instead I chose to walk to my car and leave. I didn't want to kill or hurt anyone else. And as I got to my car... One of the guys came barreling past me and dove onto my car to catch the football. When he hit the car, he left a huge dent and cracked my rear mirror. Hey! The demon angry voice exploded from my throat before I could even react. Whoa, look at you, you little fuck. What are you going to do about it? I felt my own rage build inside me along with the demon's lust for violence. Blinded by my own anger, it started to feel powerful. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I almost started to like how strong and, and invincible it made me feel. Please don't. Just leave me alone so nobody gets hurt. I finally said, still holding on to the hope that I could just leave without, without letting the demon get me stronger than it already was. <laughs> wow. <laughs> leave me alone, he repeated me. Mocking my words. Chad, look, I think this little bitch is going to start crying. Chad let out a chuckle and started walking over. The other two just sipped at their beers and watched from the edge of the overlook about 20 feet away. End them, or I will. Now! The demon screamed inside my skull. No. Please, I won't do it. I said out loud, responding to the voice in my head. What? You won't do what? 
the guy began, then shoved my shoulder, nearly knocking me to the ground before finishing his taunt. Yeah, that's right. You don't do shit, you little bitch. Chad had made it within 15 feet of us when the demon spoke again. Fine. The single word, so simple, but carried so much weight, so much meaning with it as it echoed through my mind. The guy went to shove me again, and just as he touched my shoulder, my own anger clashed with the demon's bloodlust and created a hurricane of power inside my body. The demon began to take me over, but this time was met with absolutely no resistance. My mind, tired of fighting it all these years, finally snapped, and I welcomed its control. My arms shot out and grabbed the man by the throat. Everyone froze in shock, including me, as we watched my own emaciated form suddenly swell. I felt the blood in my veins pulse with heat as I watched my virtually muscleless body transform. What the fuck? I heard Chad say as he began to run towards me. The other two grabbed the bottles they were holding as clubs and began to run towards me as well. I watched as the sudden fear swelled in the man's eyes and a grin grew on my face and suddenly I spun, throwing the man by his throat through the air, snapping his neck and crashing into Chad's, knocking them both to the ground. One of the other guys threw his bottle at me while they ran towards me, but it missed and shattered on the ground near my car. A demonic roar exploded from my chest as my eyes blacked over and I released any last semblance of control I had. The one still holding the bottle swung it at me and it connected and shattered across my face. I kicked him in the chest, sending him to the ground and sliding across the gravel on his back. Chad got up and began to run towards me. Blows connected as one of the guys swung at me with all of his might. I grabbed both arms and kicked him in the chest, ripping both of his arms free of his body and sending sprays and arcs of blood through the air. I swung one of the arms around as I spun, just as Chad got within reach and it connected with his head, sending spatters of blood across his face and body as he fell onto the ground. The now armless man remained conscious and lied, screaming in pain, as the others stood. He ran towards me and attempted some sort of jump kick, but I caught his legs and spun, releasing him and sending him flying towards the edge of the overlook. His body slowly spun upside down in the air before his head and neck caught the brick wall, causing his sudden limp body to cartwheel to the other side and off the cliff. What the, what the fuck? Chad began but he was cut short as I grabbed the back of his head and slammed it into the ground with such force that his skull shattered and caved in. I picked up Chad's now lifeless body and I threw it at the jeep. The vehicle rocked and nearly lifted two of the tires off the ground with the force of the impact. Next, I walked to the first guy and swung him by his legs into the side of the jeep. The lifeless ragdoll body slammed into the lap of Chad's after it made impact. And finally, I walked to the armless man, slowly bleeding out and screaming in pain. Laughter erupted from the background choir of voices in my head at the sound of the man's screams. I leaned down next to the man and saw nothing but pure, unbridled terror in his eyes as he looked at me. Why? Why? Is all the man could get out through sputtered breathing. A huge, billowing laugh exploded from my throat in the man's terrified face and I grabbed him by the throat and tossed him over the edge and off the cliff. Eventually, I found a cabin in the woods. I won't say where. Don't need anyone trying to find me. My physique never returned to its weak state. It was... My eyes never returned to normal either. My skin has also begun to take on a dark tint that could just be because of how much I've spent outside in the sun lately. Now, when I look in the mirror, I no longer see the demon reflected over me. Because... Because now I am the demon. And he is me. And we... are everything. Hey there, kids, and happy Halloween. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode, This October Fest, on the podcast. If you're not listening on the podcast, then you always can listen on the podcast at Spotify or just about anywhere you find a podcast. And if you're not listening on YouTube, then you can find it on YouTube or just about anywhere you find a YouTube. I just want to remind all of you that 
If you're on a cold autumn night and you need a warm drink, then my wife sells tea. There's tea available at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. All different kinds, including those themed off of creepypastas, horror icons, horror monsters, and Dungeons and Dragons. And if you order that creepypasta set with the Mr. Creepypasta's Dark and Stormy Night, the actual tea that I drink while recording these stories, uh, well, probably about 60% of the time, then you can always ask for that MCP dabbing sticker instead of the classic channel icon sticker. And I get a kick out of it every time someone asks her to do that. Also, I wanted to say thank you, all of you, who are supporting me on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta. If you ever want to help support the show, keep the lights on, feed my cats and the like, you can always head over to patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta, and you can support the show there. Even $1 is greatly appreciated. And I have a very special thank you to these guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chumpinski, Nico Kayo, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Deanna Krauss, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Corey Kenshin, Pothead Holmes, Rival 1, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, The Village Witch, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Bradley Lipe, Ann Charan, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Fooly Cooly Dude, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, and Aaron Stormcrow. And another thank you to all you guys who are in the description down below. Thank you guys so much for watching, thank you all for listening, and I hope you all have a wonderfully happy... Halloween. Sweet dreams. <laughs>